Hi and welcome back to a new video. It's finally Tuesday the 30th, which means that we can openly talk about the 11th generation from Intel. We have an 11900K sitting on my table right here. And that will be our victim for today because we will try to successfully delete the CPU. And if everything works out, we will also try to do direct die right away, which means that we're leaving away the heat spreader to achieve the best possible temperatures by putting the CPU block directly on the CPU core or the CPU die. I'm not so sure if this will work out successfully because we already analyzed an 11700K in a previous video where we know that the CPU died during the deleting process or it died afterwards. I'm not quite sure about the details, but it didn't survive. So yeah, it will be quite difficult because as you've seen in the previous video, there are some SMD components around the die. So we have to be extremely careful not to break the CPU during the deleting process. But I'm pretty sure, pretty confident we can find a way to do that. Let's go. Seasonic, the heart of your system. She is enjoying her afternoon nap right now. That's pretty typical for this time of the day, but let's go for our testing. First of all, we have to do or get some baseline numbers. As I said before, we have this C590 hours master from Gigabyte. You can see I already prepared it with the mounting kit from the Corsair XC7. CPU cooling blo block, I chose this block especially because it's kind of or very similar to all those AIO cooling blocks with this frame, you know, the way this frame is mounted. It's very similar to like Ace Tech uh, base AIOs and I'm trying to find out if we make it so far that we can achieve or try direct eye cooling, then maybe this also answers the question if this would be possible with any kind of AIOs. All right, but first of all, we have to get some baseline numbers to check what kind of clocks can we achieve with this 11900K and what kind of temperatures will we expect. That's also the perfect opportunity for me to use this Crucial Ballistics 5100 MHz memory kit, which I got sent several weeks ago, but I didn't see why I would use this with the AMD Ryzen CPUs due to the yeah, unlinked mode. It wouldn't give you as much performance, but we all know that the 11th gen is featuring a new memory controller and yeah, I will try if it's as good as they say. And yeah, 5100 MHz CL19. Let's see how this will perform and if this will work flawlessly with this mainboard and the 11900K. The setup might look a bit trashy on the first look, but that's okay because we just need fixed parameters for our temperature testing. So the pump, for example, is set to 35% fan speed. The fans are also set to a manual fan speed with a fan controller sitting in the back and that should be a good testing condition. What I also absolutely appreciate is that I just enabled XMP Profile 1 and it already straight applied to 5100 megahertz. That is a good start. I'm struggling a bit with getting this memory kit stable, which is why I might skip this for now and maybe lower the memory clock for the moment. And when I opened the BIOS and checked the PC health status where you can read out all the current voltages, I mean, the VCCSA and IO are, well, most relevant for the memory clock the auto value for SA is 1.6 volt and IO is 1.5 volt almost. I don't want to say that this is high, but that, that is extremely high. Luckily we have some voltage measurement points and now I'm just double checking if those voltages read out in the BIOS are actually real because they seem very high. And indeed it's 1.6 volt on VCC SA and that is, that is too high. And I will try to first to lower the voltage and see if that helps stability because this value is, is really too much. Otherwise, I will have to lower the memory clock. One thing that is different for Rocket Lake compared to the previous generation is that we also have two VCCIO rails. Previously, we only had one, but now we have VCCIO first and second. Well, I mean, this marking is not the greatest because like one and two is not doesn't help much, but you can identify them by the stock value. The one has 1.05 and the other one has 1.00 volt. This one, which is sitting at one volt straight, that is the, re um, the voltage which is responsible for memory overclocking. So that one can be set in our case, maybe like 1.4. You should stay between like 1.15 and 1.45. That should be the absolute maximum. Same goes for the system agent. We will try those values, but they, they are rather high values and more like typical extreme overclocking values. Yeah, those are on the upper range, but we will see if it works. And if we check on PC health status previously, we had VCCIO from 1.5 and 1.626 because that, that is too much. All right, let's check if this helps or not. Yeah, you can see still BSOD, not gonna waste much more time on that. 
I just did a base performance test. I'm not sure if those numbers should be correct. I mean, at least the boost seems to be right because we have on two cores 5.3 and on the other cores 5.1 boost, but the score seems to be a little low. 635 single, 5444 in multi, but all right. Let's just perform the manual overclocking now. Okay, I just got a new BIOS version from Gigabyte because previously I was on F3, now I'm upgrading to F5A because apart from having those memory issues, I also encountered an AVX offset issue, which means that even though I disabled AVX or even set the offset to zero, it was still going down in Cinemage R20 from like 5.1 manual overclocking to 4.7 which was quite annoying and let's hope this fixes those issues and maybe also fixing the performance issues which we saw. There's one thing I will have to investigate further. Looking at just the VRM cooling design, this is absolutely fine because we have those fin stacks right here with a ton of surface area and the temperature of the VRMs should never be an issue. But there's also a tiny fan sitting inside here. You probably cannot see that one. I have no idea why, but this fan is constantly spinning at 8,000 RPM and that, that is kind of annoying. It's reading a temperature of 51 degrees Celsius right here. I'm not sure what kind of temperature that is because it's not specified. Shouldn't be the VRM because VRM is reading 53 and that is looking cold. I have no idea, but uh, it's annoying. Finally managed to get the overclock stable. I'm currently running five gigahertz across all cores. It's not the greatest clocker by far and measured V-core on the main board, it's 1.38 volt under load. We're hitting temperatures between 80 and 90 degrees Celsius, which is surprisingly cold, I would say, considering the fact that I'm running 1.38 volt. That is definitely more than what you could run on a 10900K with 10 cores. And also look at CPU package power draw, 300 watt under load. That is pretty insane. The, the power consumption is insane, but Considering the power consumption of 300 watt, I'm kind of okay with the temperatures. All right, that should be our baseline. I will do some more temperature testing and then we will go ahead finally to do some deleting. Time to get to the more interesting, but at the same time also way more challenging part, deleting the 11900K. Just for comparison reasons, we have a 9900K, 10900K right here. You can see that the only difference is pretty much that the 10900K has a larger die, but overall both CPUs are very simple, no components are in the way. Whereas if we compare it with the 11900K, bottom left corner we have a line of caps, bottom right corner we have a line of caps, and we know that underneath right here, there is also an additional line of caps or resistors, but should be caps. Anyway, the only way we can delete the CPU from what I can judge right now is that we slightly push the IHS to this direction and then maybe move it back to use metal fatigue. Let's see. The good part is that we can still see it from above. Not perfectly, but should be enough to judge if we touch the components or not. Well, just at least subjectively speaking, you need a lot more force than with the previous generation. Probably because of the larger die and then need more surface, uh, need more force. Seems like we need much more force than I expected, so upgraded the tools. Let's see. The IHS moved, so we're going to open it up and inspect it. We're really on the edge, right here on the bottom. Cannot move the IHS any, any further without damaging any of those parts. On the bottom right, it still looks okay. So right now I will move the IHS back up into the original position and try to repeat this for like 10 times and see if metal fatigue works. If it does not work, then we will have to heat up the CPU because we know that the glue is loose at least, which means that we can put it into the oven at about 170 degrees Celsius, melt the indium and then remove the IHS. All right, it's a bit too risky for me right now. That's why I decided to put it into the oven. You can see, I still moved it down again towards the outer SMDs and I repeated this step at least 10 times, but still because the indium is very sticky and it's like a very soft metal, 
you would have to move it further to kind of release the IHS from the die, but yeah, let's just put it into the oven. It will be easier. Uh, yeah, this oven has seen, I think, more hardware than pizza, right? Set to 170 degrees Celsius. Stuff is melting at about 155. Let's wait for 20 minutes. I'm quite satisfied with the results so far, but I'm also concerned because I left a small mark on the top left corner while lifting off the IHS. So there is definitely a certain risk involved even doing it this way. I hope the CPU survived, which we will find out uh, in any minute. But first of all, just a quick comparison between the 11900K and 10900K. You can definitely see the die size difference. You can see it's quite a bit bigger and then it's only featuring 8 cores versus 10 cores, unfortunately. Also looking at the IHS, quite impressive that the entire IHS is now gold-plated from the inside. Previously, all the other CPUs were only partially gold-plated on the area where the indium was um, making contact with the die itself. The gold plating is for better wetting conditions of the indium, so it sticks better to the surface. Yeah, interesting. First of all, cleaning of the CPU. Next thing on the to-do list is clean the CPUs and IHS. First of all, removal of the glue around CPU die and also around the IHS, then remove all the indium solder, which is left on the die and also on the IHS. And before we will apply some liquid metal to replace the solder, we will use some protective paint and then cover those tiny SMDs on the bottom. Already done with the IHS, now only remaining to remove the residues from the indium solder on the die. Have to use a bit more caution on that one, just because yeah, we don't want to scratch the PCB and also not touch any of those SMDs on the bottom. One interesting aspect for me will always be, what is the die height? That, that was the 10900K and on 10900K we had a thinner die than on the 9900K. We could also figure that out by just measuring the IHS height because the essential package size is pretty much the same always. And on the 10900K the center of the IHS was about 2.6 mm high, while this seems to be the identical IHS height compared to the 9900K, which kind of would mean that the die of the 11900K would have a similar height as the 9900K. So that was thin, that was thicker. It seems like the 11900K also has a thicker die. Interesting. So quick die height measurement for that, just gluing the chip into the Dell diamond makes it much easier because I have a flat surface underneath for the measurement device. Not sure what the exact wording for this one is, is in English. All right, so die height 0.6 millimeters. That is as thin as the 10900K. That's kind of surprising. It means that the overall package is kind of lower or that the PCB got thicker. Let's check the PCB. So 10900K about 1.13 millimeter thick PCB. Okay, so there is our height difference. It's because the PCB is thicker, 1.23, so 0.1 millimeter thicker. That is actually a very, very good change for us, keeping in mind that we want to or might want to do direct dye. Because keep in mind, first of all, the dye is bigger, which means that we have a bigger surface area for our cooler to make contact. At the same time, this also means that there is less area on the PCB which can bend. And then the PCB is stronger because it's thicker. That should also help in addition for direct dye cooling. That is very nice. This could even mean that you don't even need a direct dye frame for this um, generation. Might even be that this tiny thing, this tiny thing will be enough. We will see. So quickly protecting those SMDs and then 
liquid metal time. Putting the lid back on. And for the first test, I will not re glue it, I will just put it on like this and see if it works. Moment of truth. Let's see if the CPU survived it and if we will have 00, zero or anything better. Perfect, that should be enough. First of all, a quick R20 test just to see if everything is fine or if we did some kind of raw mistake. And if that is fine, we will do the Prime 95 comparison. That actually looks quite good. Hmm. It even looks too good to be true, to be honest. All right, I will have to double check the settings and then do the Prime95 measurement to see if it's really such a huge benefit or not. I mean, the performance is on point. Temperatures were much better than expected, but it also, I mean, I have to keep in mind that the setup was not running for like 20 minutes before I started Cinebench, which means that everything was pretty cold. So first 15 minutes Prime95, just to heat up everything and then we will do the real comparison. All right, I just double checked everything uh, because I was analyzing the results and it, it kind of seems to be too good to be true. Like the temperature difference after the lidding is so huge that I cannot really explain it. I was personally expecting to see the typical three, four, maybe maximum five degrees Celsius temperature difference after the lidding. But looking at the chart, you can see that prior to deleting the average core temperature across the time measured, which was after a heat up time period of 15 minutes in Prime 95, 12K uh, size. And you can see the temperature was about 91 degrees Celsius before deleting and about average 79 degrees Celsius after deleting. So that is a temperature difference of 12 degrees Celsius. That is something I would personally expect from a CPU back then which was using conventional thermal paste but not solar tim. That's why I was kind of confused but I double checked everything like every single setting in BIOS was identical. Core voltage and also power consumption which you can see also in this graph now before the lidding it was about 297 uh, watt and after the lidding it was slightly lower by like 8 watt which is absolutely fine if you consider that the CPU was cooled a bit better and the temperature was about 10 degrees Celsius lower. That is kind of in line, so if you cool it a little bit better, it will have a lower power draw. That is kind of okay. But I didn't expect to see 12 degrees Celsius difference. And right now at this point, I also don't want to recommend deleting on those CPUs because the risk on those CPUs is enormous. You have to be so careful not to remove any of those small SMDs. And I mean, the only way you can do it is that you just use your deleter and push it a little bit so you lose the glue and then put it into the oven to kind of release the indium. That is probably the safest way, but there is still a very high risk involved deleting those CPUs. And I just want to see like two or three more results because I cannot believe that those 12 degrees Celsius are true, even though I double checked everything. Like I literally double checked absolutely everything from the room temperature, um, water temperature, fan settings, voltages, everything was in line but 12 degrees Celsius just looks so much. Not sure, not sure. All right, uh, I didn't have enough time to do the direct dye because it's now Sunday evening, it's close to midnight and I still have to finish everything for the video for Tuesday, but we will do that as soon as possible. All right, thanks for tuning in, see you next time, bye bye.